Uh, good evening, everyone, uh, and welcome to tonight's Spirit Falling Forum, or FOF as we've been calling it. Um, my name is Rachel Mead, and I'm the Injury Prevention Manager at Injury Matters. Sorry. Of course, technology doesn't have a way. <laughs> I'd like to start by acknowledging the Wadjuk Noongar people, the traditional custodians of the land that we're on today, and pay my respect to Elders past and present and extend that welcome um, to any Aboriginal people present today. I hope that you have all helped yourself uh, to something like to eat. There's plenty of food left over, so after the event, um, uh, please stay and have something to eat and network with your colleagues. Uh, to start off with, uh, if you haven't found them already, the toilets are just located outside the door and to the right. Uh, in case of an emergency, if you can um, please follow the Injury Matters staff uh, out and we will muster in the Lake Munger Park across the road from the car park. I ask that you'll take a moment now to check that your phones are on silent. Um, it's a bit of respect for the presenters and your colleagues. And uh, as Gemma mentioned at the front door, there will be photos taken throughout the night. Uh, if you don't want your photo taken, please just uh, uh, gently remind the photographer um, if they do so. <laughs> so this evening's forum will address uh, the issue of fear of falling and the multidisciplinary approaches to manage this. Fear of falling is common, even in the absence of recent falls, and often underreported. During the forum, we'll be joined by local guest speakers, each with a wealth of knowledge and experience working with older adults and falls across various healthcare settings. Our speakers will each be exploring a major theme of fear of falling and explore different approaches to managing this. This, evening topics, this evening's topics will include um, understanding fear of falling and its impact, identification screening and tools, uh, the psychological management and cognitive behaviour therapy for fear of falling, exercise to reduce fear of falling, and nurse and OT management practices. We hope that the forum will equip you with up-to-date evidence and useful information that will, you can use to address fear of falling with your clients. After the presentations, there will be a panel uh, discussion. So please, if you have any questions throughout um, this evening, jot them down and then uh, we'll have a microphone roaming around um, that you can use to uh, question the experienced panel. So uh, Injury Matters is a not-for-profit organisation that's been preventing injury and supporting recovery in Western Australia for over 26 years. Our vision is for safer people and places and our purpose is to pre prevent and reduce the impact of injury and support those affected. We do this through the provision of injury prevention uh, programs and services. We want to influence policymakers that injury prevention is a priority in Western Australia, empower individuals and communities that they can make changes to prevent injury, and collaborate with researchers, policymakers and practitioners like yourselves on shared solutions for injury prevention and support of recovery. Injury Matters has three uh, core programs that we deliver, no injury, road trauma support and stay on your feet. No injury provides information, resources, training and networking opportunities for health professionals, local governments and community organisations to prevent injuries. And we do this through um, our No Learn Connect pillars. So we want people to know about different injury types and we have lots of different useful fact sheets and infographics that you can use to advocate for injury um, in Western Australia, such as uh, our um, falls infographic, which demonstrates the, um, the size of the problem in WA. We have other um, information resources and toolkits um, on priority populations such as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and um, remote and regional and remote injuries in WA. We want people to learn about a public health approach to injury prevention and provide um, training and education op opportunities. And I've included a couple of upcoming things on the screen there as well. And we want to connect like-minded people. And we do this um, through providing networking opportunities. Not only does Injury Matters care about preventing injury, but we also want to be able to support those people that are affected 
um, so that they can get on with their lives. And we offer the Road Trauma Support Service, which is a free statewide counselling service for people that are affected by road trauma. We have trained psychologists and counsellors that offer free counselling, either to the person in person, over the phone or via Skype, regardless of the individual's role um, or involvement in the incident. We also provide information, support and workshops for people coping with grief and loss after a road trauma. <coughs> and thirdly, the program that you're probably all pretty familiar with is Stay On Your Feet. So Stay On Your Feet is WA's uh, leading falls prevention program for older adults living in the community and our aim is to reduce falls and falls from related injuries. Stay On Your Feet is funded through the Department of Health and I want to say thank you to the department for their ongoing commitment to falls. <coughs> and through this we're able to provide information, resources and education for both community members and health professionals like yourselves. We do this through awareness raising and workforce engagement strategies. So each year we run two campaigns that focus on a modifiable risk factor for falls promoted through our Move, Improve, Remove messaging. We're currently in the Check Your Medicines campaign, which includes uh, mass media, so radio and newspaper advertising. Uh, we provide resources um, such as brochures, videos, checklists, animations that you can use with your clients. We provide grants each campaign for organisations um, and individuals like yourself to run a small pilot project in the community. And we have peer education presentations. Um, so through our peer education program, we're able to get out to around two to 3,000 people each year and directly talk to them about falls. And they're run in the Perth metro area and in Bunbury. And we also have training events uh, for health professionals, such as events like tonight. We have online e-learning, um, and, and other forums such as our Check Your Medicines Forum that's coming up next week. We're able to support activities like the Grassroots Falls Conference, which you'll hear a little bit about tonight, I'm hoping, um, that's running in November. So there's, there's a whole lot to stay on your feet. Um, so I encourage you, if, if you're not familiar with it, please have a chat to one of the Injury Matters staff tonight about any of the programs I've spoken about, and they'll be pleased to talk to about it. So falls are a priority for us at Injury Matters, but they're also a public health priority in WA. They're the leading cause of unintentional injury for people aged 65 years and older. And with one in three adults falling each year, increasing to one in two over the age of 80, um, it's a significant problem. Between 2011 and 2015, there were nearly 1,200 deaths and um, 119,000 hospitalisations due to falls. In 2015 alone, there was 281 falls-related deaths and, and it cost an estimated $197 million in um, bed days. A, replete, a report released on the incidence and cost of injury for 2012 showed that the estimated cost of falls when taking into consideration hospital, emergency department costs, insurance commission data, loss of paid productivity and quality of life lost was $2.2 billion. Falls were a quarter of all the injury-related costs in Western Australia. So they're a significant problem. I don't think this is new to any of you probably. Um, the problem is that while it's a big number, $2.2 billion, it's really just the tip of the iceberg because that um, data um, didn't capture those people that didn't present to hospital, that didn't capture the people going to see their GP and their pharmacist didn't capture people that were just getting lifted by um, St John Ambulance and returned to their feet, not going to the hospital. Often falls are just considered accidents or a result of getting older. However, as you know, they are the, often an interaction between a number of risk factors. They don't just happen. They occur as a result of a mismatch interaction between the person and their environment. Usually there's a reason why people fall, and it can be classified into two categories, intrinsic, um, which are um, characteristics about the person themselves, or in extrinsic risk factors, which are factors uh, in the environment, such as poor lighting, slippery surfaces. Older people have a unique set of intrinsic and extrinsic factors that increase their risk of falling. Despite these risks, there are modifiable factors that with appropriate interventions can lower a person's risk by reducing 
or minimising that individual's risk. Fear of falling can be described as the persistent or related the persistent feeling related to the risk of falling during doing these everyday activities. It's an important psychosocial factor associated with falls in older people. It can be prevalent in older people and often distressing, resulting in both physical and social limitations that we'll talk about tonight. The, show, the slide up here shows um, that the impact um, of the fear of falling, it's a cycle. Most obvious is the loss of confidence in the individual initially. The loss of confidence and increase in fear means that the person reduces the amount of activities they do. Being immobile increases, or sorry, decreases their strength and balance and also um, decreases their um, mental health and social health because they become more isolated. The increase in frailty increases their risk of falling and decreases their quality of life and independence. Understanding fear of falling and how it impacts on the risks provides us a valuable basis for reducing future and recurrent falls. Healthcare staff, both that work in hospital and in the community and in residential care, who provide support and care for older adults, have the opportunity to identify and manage fear of falling, which increases people's quality of life. I'd now like to share with you Janet's story. Janet has a fear of falling, which has impacted on her confidence and her everyday life. I used to feel um, that nobody understood. 
which they have fallen, I have fallen, so that they can understand how I am still in one. Because oh, that fall is just a fall, and it's not just a fall. That fall impacted on me quite severely over the six weeks, well, deep longer than six weeks. And it was quite incredible how I was living. I was depressed. I had lost control of anything that I, that I used to do, which had all been taken away from me, and it was just awful. Um, it just took me back to my cow accident, how I felt then. I was bad, but I just felt as if um, my comfort was just oozed out of me. So silly, but it just, just left me. And I'm just thinking, you know. In trouble, in trouble. I like to clean my own home. It's when I clean my clean. I just got a nice clean house. I love a bit of a clean tree. And all that was taken away from me. I couldn't do that anymore. And so people had to come in and help me. But it wasn't the same because they never did it as well as I did. I couldn't go shopping. I couldn't do anything with you. Uh, my sister used to take shopping, but then I had to hold on to something because I was so scared of falling. As I said, I don't think the fall is just a fall. Well, you know, you no know, matter if you break something or not, it does impact a lot on your life socially. Everything and confidence is just, and you just see that people just use a lot of support to, to get out there and start, you know, more life again. But it's not like to me. I'd now like to invite our first uh, speaker to the stage. So Professor Keyfield is a physiotherapist and senior researcher at Curtin University with 38 years clinical experience in rehabilitation and aged care. He has an extensive track record in implementing and completing a range of falls prevention, rehabilitation and physical activity research programs for older people in the community, hospital and residential aged care settings. Professor Hill has 260 peer-reviewed publications and has received over 23 million of research funding as a chief investigator. He has been the chair of the IAGG Asia Oceana Council for the past four years and has a strong interest in supporting collaborative research within the Asia Oceana region. This evening, Keith will provide us with a background understanding of what fear of falling is, the impact and current evidence on fear of falling. Please join me in welcoming Keith. Yeah. Thanks Rachel and it's great to see such a large audience. I think we started off with a venue of about 40 and it just kept snowballing so obviously it's a topic that's of great interest. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of an overview and some of what I say you will hear again through some of the other presentations, but probably a bit more of a practical bent on some of the things that I'll be talking about, which is a bit more from the research perspective. So I'll be covering what is fear of falling, how common is it, risk factors, the impact, some of what we heard from our case study just now, focusing a bit on measuring and also touching on some research evidence at the end. So I'm just going to start with another case study, if it will work, but it doesn't look like this one. Oh, yes. So this is Mary, who is a real patient of mine from a while ago in Melbourne, but just wanted to bring a little bit of that reality around the fall. No older people were, were harmed in the <laughs> beginning of this. But when Mary 
had a fall, and this is her real life scenario, what she didn't do was report her fall. She didn't tell family, she didn't go to a GP, and the reality is that's around about 25% of older people do report a fall. Um, and so we've got a long way to go if we as health professionals are to be able to help older people who are falling to get them to actually report when a fall or even near falls, unsteadiness. They're all things that we should be aware of and that we can do things to intervene if we get uh, early information about those things. So this is a list of ident uh, identifying risk factors for falls and we're not going to go into risk factors for falls much tonight. It's really around fear of falling but the important point to note here is that Fear of falling in its own right is a risk factor for falls. And this is some work that was done pulling together a range of different studies on risk factors. And on the right hand side, you can see the odds ratio, which is how much that risk factor increases your risk of falling. And so for fear of falling, if you have fear of falling compared to someone who doesn't have fear of falling, you have about a 1.8, about an 80% increase in risk of falling because of that fear of falling. Okay, so it is an important predictor of future falls. That's one aspect of fear of falling and one reason we might want to be looking at it. What I want to highlight with this slide is around the continuum of balance impairment. At one end of the spectrum, we've got healthy older people and for health professionals, we sometimes forget about that group because we don't tend to see them a lot in our work. Um, I've heard stories where a reasonably well older person uh, goes into a GP and mentions having a fall or some near falls and the GP says, you're 80 years of age, what do you expect? Um, just slow down a little bit, take a bit more care. And that, that group, and, and from a health promotion point of view, that is a very important uh, uh, group for us to be targeting. So. What we do tend to get involved in a lot is this green bar part where people have got moderate to pretty severe levels of false risk and we're constantly seeing those people. We can definitely do a lot in preventing falls and also improving fear of falling in that group. But the thing I want to just put a bit of focus on is this early identification. Thinking about when people are starting to feel a bit unsteady, having uh, near falls, minor falls, and or starting to lose a little bit of confidence, curtailing a bit of activity. Those are all signs that something's not quite right. And if we can get in there at that stage, our likelihood of a successful intervention, rather than this person going through that cycle that Rachel talked about and ultimately having high level of false risk, hopefully we can intervene there. So how common is it? Um, I've put down there that it's common, um, but it's often hidden and, and unrecognised. So when a, an older person has a fall and they break their, their forearm or their hip, you know, it's an obvious injury and all of the care goes in. Sometimes we look a bit too much at injury management and not what caused the fall. That's a different story. But as was mentioned in that case study before, if it's not an obvious injury, it's often not looked at and not uh, not treated. And so part of the challenge in getting data about frequency of this sort of problem is that people don't recognise that it's there and they don't ask about it. In the research literature, there's a very wide range of reported prevalence of fear of falling, somewhere between 20 and 85%. That depends on how you ask the question, uh, what tools you use, what sort of sample. So if you're looking at a high risk, falls risk sample versus a reasonably well older sample, you'll get quite different data. I would say if we're looking at older people generally out there in the community, we're probably looking at about 25 to 30% of older people will have some level of fear of falling. We need to remember that even though we've talked a bit about vicious cycles and that falls is often one part of that vicious cycle, that fear of falling can be present even when a person doesn't fall, hasn't had a fall. And that's an important thing to um, understand and to look for. So even someone who hasn't fallen, we could be asking the question, how confident are you? Are there things that cause you anxiety or fear of falling? Uh, women and increasing age are associated with uh, higher levels of fear of falling. 
<clears throat> now, this is a fairly old a couple of studies that look at the frequency of fear of falling in comparison to other types of fears for older people. And uh, I was quite surprised when I saw these results. Um, things like fear of being robbed, fear of um, uh, financial difficulties, fear of losing a cherished item, fear of having a serious health problem, these are often fairly substantial concerns for older people. But fear of falling in both of these studies was a much more common fear than any of these other fears. And so, and, and it was in that 25 to 30% range in these samples. So it really puts in context how important fear of falling is to older people. So I've touched on a couple of things that were associated with fear of falling, so being female and age, uh, increasing age, but things like decreased satisfaction with life, uh, depressed mood, frailty, recent experience of falls, reduced mobility, reduced social activity are associated and are risk factors for falling, or for fear of falling, sorry. So having said all of that, the next thing is, well, how do we identify that it's there? And there are many different ways that we can uh, uh, try to address that question. And I'm going to differentiate two things here. One is fear of falling and one is false efficacy. And these two sets of terms are often used interchangeably, but they are a little bit different. So fear of falling is a lasting concern about falling that leads to an individual avoiding activities that he or she remains capable of performing. So a couple of the key elements there, it's lasting. So it's there and uh, not going away, it's not short term. Um, and it's in the context of what the person is able to perform. So if they're, if they're not able to do the activity, whether or not they're fearful, that, that's um, not part of the definition there. The simplest way that we can start asking older people about this is just the, the simple question, are you afraid of falling? And I've put on this table some pros and some cons for each of these different approaches. So. From a clinical point of view, the big pro for a simple single question is it's quick. Um, and so it gets a big tick on that. The cons are that it's dichotomous. Either you've got it or you haven't. And that's not what we see. What we see in real life is that fear of falling is a continuum from a little bit, from none to a little bit, to a moderate amount, to a lot. And what, when we look at it, we should be trying to quantify that. So the next level is with another simple single question, we could ask around how afraid are you of falling? And so this we could use on a five or a 10 point scale, single, single question again, very brief. It does grade that level of risk, which is a good step above, just asking are you afraid? But the cons with this one is that it doesn't allow for uh, differing fear of falling in different circumstances. And what we do find is that depending on how you ask the question, a person might give very different answers. Uh, a patient who is you're visiting them in the home and they're very confident in their home, they've got the furniture just right, they're doing a bit of furniture walking around the house, you ask them if, if they have any fear of falling, they'll say no. You take them out the front door and try and get them to walk to the letterbox and that'll be a completely different answer. And so that situation-specific side of fear of falling is important to understand, and you can't get that just with a single question. So then we get down to some more complex ways of uh, asking or measuring uh, fear of falling and or false efficacy. So false efficacy is the level of confidence that a person has in performing activities of daily living without falling. So how confident are you that you can do X, go up and down stairs without falling. And usually these are on a, a scale of 0 to 10 or 0 to 4. So they're more detailed, they grade level of risk, and they allow for differing fear in differing circumstances. The cons though are they can be more time consuming and, and in some ways some of the constructs are a little bit confusing for some older people. So for some people, the more complex tools may not be the best answer. So there's quite a lot of different tools out there to measure false efficacy uh, or confidence. 
This all started back in 1990. I remember it well, but probably a lot of you guys don't. Um, when Mary Tonetti, who was a one of the pioneers of falls prevention research, developed the falls of fixity scale. Prior to that, we had no tools for this. That was a 10-item scale uh, with 10 different activities, and each activity rated 0 to 10. So it was a very good development. <clears throat> but this was at a time when I was getting underway a bit with research in falls prevention, and what we felt this tool missed was that all of the activities were pretty much indoor activities. And if you have fear of falling on indoor activities, you've got a pretty big fear of falling. And so we actually modified the force of fixity scale to make the modified force of fixity scale. We added four extra items to Mary Tonetti's 10 item scale. And the four items we added were things where people might be more likely to start to, to get a bit of fear at an early stage and might start to curtail. So we added using public transport going up and down stairs. So these are some of the things, and they actually, when we did the research on it, did actually find people who were starting to have fear of falling on those extra four items that weren't present on the original 10 items. So particularly when you're looking at trying to get that early level of risk, uh, early level of fear of falling, um, having some sensitivity at that upper end is important. There was the activity and balance confidence scale that developed about the same time, 16 items. Um, it has had quite a lot of work done in the research and in clinical practice. It has a couple of limitations around some of the items. It's an American tool and one of the items it says is um, how confident are you uh, that you won't fall over when you're walking on an icy footpath. In Perth, I can't remember seeing an icy footpath, but I've only been here seven years. Um, but that takes away a bit of the, um, the real-life activity side of things. Um, more recently, there were developments called the Force of Fixity Scale International, FESI, and then a short form of that, so a 16-item and a short form of a 7-item, which are probably now the most widely used tools. Um, and I'll just show you the short item one in a minute. And there's also been a more recent tool called the Iconographic FES Scale, which tries to help where older people might have a bit of difficulty with comprehending the constructs of what you're asking. And so in that sense, I think it, it's, it's a useful add-on. Important with the FESI, the international scale, is it's been translated and validated in over 20 languages. And uh, there's a website, I think our slides are going to be available to you. There's a website which has got the translated version. So if you're working with multicultural groups, um, that might be useful for you. So this is the short FESI, so it's just seven items, uh, not at all concerned, somewhat fairly or very concerned, and it's got a few indoor items and a few outdoor items in there. So it, it's a good tool from my perspective and fairly short from a clinical point of view. This is the iconographic FES, and you can see for each of the activities there's actually a graphic, an image that will help understanding around uh, what we're, we're talking about, and also the graphics in terms of how you respond. So for some people that might be a better tool, and it's had some developmental work done on it, and it's shaping up pretty well. So in reality what we have to think about is Fear of falling in the context of the individual. For some older people, having fear of falling is extremely appropriate. And if they don't have fear of falling, then we have a job to do. And so in the middle here, you've got where balance and falls efficacy are well aligned. And, uh, and so if someone does have a moderate balance impairment, they should have at least a, a, some level of fear of falling. And if they don't, we need to work to help to orient them to the potential risks that they have. On the left-hand side, we've got people who have good balance but low force fixity, so major loss of confidence. And uh, at an extreme end, this can be a, a really severe anxiety-type problem. And I've only seen a fairly small number of these people. Um, but it is a very, very difficult group to deal with if there's a major mismatch. And for this, uh, in one example of this, I was able, if, if a lady was walking and just having fingertip pressure with me, I was with her, 
and we could do anything. If I stepped away, I left her in the middle of an open room, she was petrified and major, major fear of falling. And so that to work with that often will require quite a strong and different approach and we might hear a bit about some of that tonight. My sense is from a psychological point of view, you would look at some psychological approaches and some staged exposure to um, things that are slightly graduated and more exposure to, to fear. And the other um, element is where balance is poor, or mobility is poor, and we've got high falls of efficacy. So this is really where people may have perceptual or cognitive impairment type problems. They don't have the safety mechanisms in place uh, for their level of balance impairment. And so again, that mismatch of falls of efficacy and, and balance is where we have a problem and we need to work hard on that. So this comes back to that vicious cycle, and I'm asking a bit of a question here, is it a vicious cycle? And we've heard uh, around some of the things where the, this could be very true for some patients. But what I want to put on the table with you is that it might not apply to all of our patients. So a lot of the literature, some of the problems are we tend to look at these things in a one-off basis and we don't tend to look at it over time. So if we're seeing a person and their balance, mobility, falls or fixed at a certain time, over time they have a fall, what happens shortly after that fall to their falls confidence? And there's not terribly much in that space. Um, I did mean to acknowledge in my first slide or two Frances Batchelor, who's a physio in, in Melbourne, who did her PhD with me a number of years ago and she looked at stroke patients uh, who were discharged home from rehab and put in place an intervention program but tried to follow them up over the next 12 months. And fear of falling was one of the things that she looked at. And so this slide she's generously allowed me to use, but it, it looks like a mess. Um, this is all of the different patients, each of the different lines on this graph, in terms of their fear of falling measure over 12 month period. We measured Every th three, every four months, sorry, so three times over the year, we measured everybody, and then we went in after any fall, and within two weeks, we measured them again. But if you look at that, there's no pattern to fear of falling. It's a very difficult thing to interpret. But we then went and had a look at a few different patients, and what we see there is that patients respond differently. The red lines on this, um, on this, uh, when a fall occurred. And so you can see after this fall, there was not much change to fear of falling. After this fall, there was actually a bit of improvement in falls of fixed and fear of falling. Same here, and then after this fall, quite a large drop. So within one individual patient, different things around the fall, the circumstances, the environment, a whole range of factors may have impacted on how fear of falling was affected. So this is suggesting that we can't just assume that even within one patient that it's going to be the same response. Uh, this is another patient who had two falls, two red lines, and absolutely no effect on fear of falling. So again, a different scenario. So uh, the bottom line with this, and I could show you another 140 of these, but they're all different. And so we do have to look at each patient separately. And so it is uh, really a bit more complex than that, that cycle, and there's a lot of things that feed into um, the sports efficacy and ultimately fall. So we've got some of the risk factors, some of the appraisal of abilities, other contributors like previous falls, beliefs, personality, social supports, all of these things will impact on an individual to the point where that will, the combination of these things will determine how an individual patient will respond to falls. So coming to the end of my presentation is, well, so what, we can measure it now. Um, and it's a bit different in different patients, but can we do anything about it? Um, there's not a large amount of research that's focused just on fear of falling. Putting in place an intervention with fear of falling is the main outcome, 
Quite a lot of our falls prevention studies, which are aiming to reduce falls, also measure fear of falling. And a lot of those, that, that is a secondary measure, but uh, a lot of those studies have shown that we can reduce fear of falling uh, with some of our falls prevention interventions. So what should we think about with respect to uh, targeting? Um, we could look at the psychological side, the anxiety, and uh, try and work on that side. The physical factors, and we, we'll be hearing about exercise tonight, looking at the specific falls risk factors and addressing those, so improving someone's vision, reducing their polypharmacy. That may be all that the person needs to reduce their, their fear of falling, or all of the above, probably, in the ideal world. Now, this is a, a pretty small slide, but what this shows you is a couple of things. This is exercise studies that have aimed to improve falls efficacy. Uh, it's a meta-analysis, it's a Cochrane review, which is the Bible to researchers. Um, it's got randomised trials, and so each of these lines is an individual randomised trial. It's been grouped according to the type of measure. So this is asking a single question. This is falls of fixity scale or the modified scale. This one's the ABC and this is the FESI. So the different tools that I've mentioned. And it's grouped the effects on those different tools. And not surprisingly, asking the same single question, you've just got so much variability, it's not going to be effective. Um, uh, but clearly when we start to look at uh, things like the yeah, FES and the MFES. This line of unity, anything on this side, suggests that the study improved false efficacy with the exercise intervention. Anything on this side is that false efficacy got worse. And so the, the diamond at the bottom of this set of studies shows that there was actually a 40% reduction, 40% improvement, because that diamond's fully on the right-hand side of that line. These other ones are not quite significant, but there's only two studies with the FESI and short FESI. And overall, this diamond on the bottom suggests that across all of these studies, there is an effect. So bottom line from that fairly busy slide is exercise works to reduce falls. So Tony doesn't have to talk. <laughs> Perhaps he has to tell us what we have to put in the exercise. The other main area of um, research in this area is cognitive behavioural therapy. So this is looking at things like cognitive restructuring, personal goal setting, promoting physical activity, and perhaps doing it in an incremental way from where the person's comfortable with their fear to gradually exposing them to higher levels of fear. There are six studies in this uh, systematic review. It's just about to be published. Um, four of them were group interventions, two were individualised, but they did have good effects. So significant immediate benefits after the intervention in fear of falling, significant retention of benefits after 12 months, which is a very good outcome, and some improvements in balance at six months. So the approach of combining the psychological and trying to get people doing a little bit more physically uh, seems to be effective. So that's where I'm going to finish up. Uh, a couple of take-home messages. Fear of falling is a major problem which warrants greater uh, improved management, improved identification and greater research. Um, there's a range of different tools available to, to measure and we need to particularly think at that early end of the spectrum as well, those people who are starting to lose confidence, a little bit unsteady on their feet, looking for gaze aids and so on. Early intervention, um, early identification and intervention is likely to give you the best effects um, and that exercise and that psychological approach are probably the two main areas that we can look at uh, from the randomised trial level of things. And just to finish off, I will do a plug for the Grassroots Festival. It is in September, not November, <laughs> uh, September the 19th to, uh, and 20th. But abstracts close, and if anyone's got any interesting work at all, doesn't have to be randomised trials. We're looking at really what works in your settings. If you've got something that you'd like to present, um, you've got till the end of March to submit your abstracts. So we look forward to seeing you there. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. I would have hated to be late.
to the conference. <laughs> um, so I'd now like to introduce our second speaker, Sue Kitchen. Sue is a clinical nurse consultant in falls management at Sir Charles Gardner Hospital. Sue cares passionately about patient safety and reducing falls, harm from falls, and minimising the detrimental and traumatic effect that a fall can have on an individual. Sue has been in falls prevention for 10 years and has a background of extensive experience in multiple specialties. Working collaboratively with healthcare professionals across the state, nationally and internationally, Sue has assisted in developing and implementing multiple programs, um, policies, guidelines and documentation, as well as educational resources. These aim to increase patient safety and health professional knowledge of falls management. Sue is the founder of the popular Grassroots Falls Conference and the Sir Charles Gardner Hospital Falls Lecture Series. Sue was awarded the Jill Porteous Memorial Award in 2016 at the WA Health Excellence Award Awards for her work in falls prevention. This evening, Sue will share her professional experience and perspectives um, on screening and identification of fear of falling um, in both the hospital and community settings. Sound good, don't I? <laughs> anyway, all right, let's talk about screening and identification um, of fear of falling. Thank you, Keith, that was a brilliant presentation. Um, and actually, uh, I probably don't need to be here. <laughs> but I hope that I can just give some something different. So, some of the slides have got a lot of information on, and I'm not going to go through it point by point, but it is available on the Stay On Your Feet website, so the information is really just there um, for you at a later point. I'm going to look at the symptoms of uh, fear of falling and some of the screening tools, including anxiety and depression screens. I give a summary of information that is required for health professional assessment of the patient. Uh, talk about when screening should actually start and the studies available for frequent fear of falling, sorry, and specific medical conditions. Uh, we've all got a definition of fear of falling. Uh, mine is an ongoing concern about falling that ultimately limits undertaking of daily activities. It can come on quite insidiously, so it can come on gradually uh, without even the, the person actually noticing until it's too late, or it can come on uh, very quickly after a trauma or a traumatic fall. So some of the potential indicators. We've got retropulsion. So that's obviously where you have um, your gravity center is kept backwards. You've got an increase in the variability of gait. So that's a uh, fast, slow, wide step, narrow step, um, a weaving gait. You've got your changes in your tug, timed up and go, and uh, sit to stand scores. Reduce curtailment of normal activity. So, uh, as Keith mentioned about the mailbox, uh, some people go down to the mailbox daily and then when you start to notice that either they're not going or they're trying to make excuses not to go or they might only be going instead of every day, they might just go once a week, then you know that there is an issue and probably it's fear of falling. They lunge and clutch and grab furniture or people, we've all um, known patients like that. They often have a low mood and depression, just like Janet. We saw Janet there. She clearly was extremely low and very traumatised um, by the, the fear of falling. And then this one is a classic. So purchasing or using a walking aid, but they don't actually need one. They feel safer with a walking aid, but they really, um, it's not indicated. So I call this the fear of falling screening maze. There are multiple screens available, as Keith has just explained. Several are validated. There are actually several combinations, which I'll talk to you in a little while. Uh, you have to apply efficacy screening at the same time as doing all of this. You've got to consider the medical conditions that the patient has and the effect that it has and how that is uh, impacting on their fear. 
Uh, anxiety and depression screening is required. You need to think about the cultural consideration, the patient perception, the carer perception, your perception, and if every single one of those will be completely different. Uh, your knowledge and your skills, so you might have a junior health professional that's working with that patient, and we don't know what we don't know, so we need to be aware of that. And we need to differentiate between the fear preventing or reducing activity. Is it normal or abnormal? And by whose perception? Is that by our perception or by the patient's perception? Is it persisting? Who says it's persisting? So it's just looking at all of that information, and that's what I mean. I think it's a bit of a maze. Um, points to remember that there is significant characteristic and functional differences between those who express fear of falling, performing um, community environmental activities, and those who um, express fear of falling, uh, performing in home environmental activities. Probably the home environmental activities is the most important. If they're going out into the community, they clearly have a bit of a resilience. Uh, and they're able to cope with that fear. And if you had to choose, I would be going for the person who is at home and afraid. So the assessment, as Keith said, the yes, no answer um, is uh, not very broad, really, uh, but it may well be a start in some settings. It's very subjective and I would say that you use the like heart scale. Obviously, you need to consider the efficacy, but for a quick assessment, the like heart scale is probably quite good. You need to decide on your terminology. So it might be that your patient is anxious, concerned, worried, uneasy about falling, <clears throat> but to say afraid, afraid might mean anything, and it might mean that they are uh, they were afraid, this is extreme, but afraid when they were in London and the blitz was happening. Compare that to a fear of falling and it might not actually be the same. I was with a, a lady the other day and I was talking to her about falls and she kept talking about the word bothered. I'm bothered. So I put that in and I said, are you bothered that you might fall? Are you not at all bothered, slightly bothered? You know, using that terminology. That was easy, she understood exactly what I was talking about. The thing is though, if you are using terminology like that, you need to document it and make sure that that goes on in, in their record to other health professionals and other services. So if we use that in a hospital, we need to make sure that we are passing that on into the community so that the same terminology is being used and we can actually um, make a comparison. Um, the uh, falls efficacy scale, uh, which obviously Keith has uh, already explained, it is um, in an iPad version. That's all I'm going to say because Keith has said the rest. And I don't know whether any of you have seen the iPad. I was actually going to bring it with me. It's brilliant, absolutely fantastic. It's bright, it's cheerful, it's, you know, it's large. Um, and, it, and it's very, very good for those that have got vision impairment and those that might have a little bit of a cognition impairment as well. Uh, then you've got the uh, modified force efficacy scale. Now this um, is a, a little bit similar, uh, but it's an if you do an admission emphasis, so when they come into hospital and you do one of these, uh, the score is less than five. It's a very effective predictor of patient falls and is associated with a longer hospital stay. Now we probably already know that as soon as the patient comes in, but it's another score that we can utilize uh, looking at force intervention and force risk. Then we have the uh, AFRIS, and this is looking at patients who will take up an intervention. You know, they're not gonna take everything up that we suggest. We know that, they don't recommend. We recommend things and they, they just ignore us sometimes, um, even though they know it's a good thing to do. So this, is, this will measure what they will do. You can use it as inpatient uh, facilities as well as community. So between 50 and 90% of people reject uh, falls-related um, interventions, and we need to know why. Uh, the interventions can then be offered in a very acceptable way. It's the only scale that has been developed and validated for this purpose and you put in the interventions that you feel might be appropriate. 
Obviously, uh, looking at documentation and uh, communication, a copy must be put in the notes so that future um, health professionals know exactly what you have suggested and they can follow up perhaps as to whether it's been um, followed through with the patient. And this is part of what it looks like. So doing intervention would be good for me. So if we said um, doing walking down to the mailbox every day would be good for you, and they said we disagree strongly, there's no point giving them that, um, that intervention, that exercise. You need to find something else that they can work with. The uh, ABC. Um, activity specific balance confidence scale. Um, again, just like Keith has said, it's validated. It's for highly functioning seniors um, and it detects their loss of balance confidence. 16 questions and you rate your confidence on a score of 0 to 100% and then you average it out. It's quite a good score because you can use it um, during or prior to an interview. So you, you, an interview, you can actually send this out to the patients and they can fill it in um, and then you can go over it on the telephone or in person. A score will indicate either low to high levels of functioning and a less than 67% means that they have a substantial risk of falling. And that's some of what it looks like. Then we have the SAFE, so the Survey of Activities and Fear of Falling in the Elderly. This was developed to assess the role of fear during the performance of 11 activities. And these are, for example, uh, showering, going to the store, uh, taking public transportation, going to movies or going to a show. So it's not only looking at the home, it's also looking outside. The categories are, the response categories are never, sometimes and always avoid. And it allows for the analysis of when activities are avoided and why. So is it due to fear alone? Is it due to fear along with other reasons? Or is it due only to reasons other than fear? So it really helps to break that down and give you a much deeper analysis. SAFE has been used in studies with older people and older people after they've sustained a hip fracture and in people with Parkinson's. Uh, a lot of the evidence that I found was mostly around Parkinson's disease and it has been very useful. You can use uh, some uh, assessments in tandem with each other and the ABC and the Berg Balance Scale is um, an example. So we know that non-fallers have significantly faster reaction times. They have higher scores on their Berg balance scale and the ABC scale, and they sway at slower, they sway at slower frequencies when compared to fallers. Totaling up the ABC and the Berg balance scales um, that, that um, the assessment has completed, uh, it contributed significantly to the prediction of the fall, so an 89% uh, sensitivity and a 96% specificity. So it could be a very good uh, combination to utilise, for example, in a pre-admission clinic. So it could be performed and we would know, um, have more information about how at risk that patient was when they were coming into hospital. Moving on to anxiety and depression. Now we know that uh, depression is one of the critical issues linked to fear of falling. We also know that it's a critical issue in life today and it is an independent risk factor for falling. You don't need anything else wrong with you, but if you have depression, you're at very high risk of falling. And the reason for that is um, apart from the mania, we'll leave the mania aside, you're not moving you're not functioning, you're probably not eating or you're overeating, you're not drinking or you're drinking too much or you're drinking alcohol, you're not going out, you're not socialising, you've shut yourself down completely, you're not moving. It's a horrible, horrible disease. But because of that, and then on top of that, we give you medication that is going to increase your risk of falling, make you drowsier, um, give you dizziness. So all of that com combines to increase an older person's particularly risk of falling and fear of falling. So you need to screen for, for that. And we'll look at the generalised uh, anxiety score, the GAD, 
And this is seven questions. It's very, very quick, but it assesses for depression and anxiety. And it uh, does scores of 5, 10 and 15. So, for example, 0 to 4 indicates the patient has minimal anxiety, whereas 15 to 21, they have severe anxiety. This means that when you've got this score, you can then do another action, which will probably be uh, referring to the medical staff, referring to the GP to try and get this sorted. But then there's also actions that you can put into place to help reduce that anxiety. This one is very, very good as well for panic disorder uh, and social anxiety disorder and post-traumatic stress. So it does cover uh, a lot of options, a lot of diseases. You've got the patient health uh, questionnaire. Sorry, I'm watching the time. Um, the patient health questionnaire, and again, used to provisionally diagnose depression and grade the severity of the symptoms. Very good tool, very, very simple. Then you've got, you'll be sick of these, um, all this screening. I'm nearly at the end. Uh, you can see why I think that this is amazing. The amount of screening tools that are available for us to use. When do you use them? How do you use them? Who do you use them with? So the hospital anxiety and depression score, uh, again, it's 14 questions, very, very quick, suitable for inpatients as well as community and RCF. It's a self-rating scale and it measures both anxiety and depression. So the scoring will give you a grade for each. So you might have depression, but you don't have anxiety. I mean, they're normally linked, but you, you don't need to have both. So you could have zero to seven, which is a non-case of anxiety, but you might have an 11 plus of depression. So it's a two in one scale. The geriatric depression scale, again, this is an iPad uh, view that you can see. Uh, it's used to identify the depression in older people, hospital, RCF and uh, community. 15 questions. Uh, Patients that have got a mini mental score of more than 14 um, are also able to utilise this. This one's particularly simple because you have got the, the tick and the cross and it's very large, it's very visible. My only complaint is that the actual question is in quite tiny writing, so you do need to be with the patient. This one is where I was talking about you, you, have, uh, you need to know the medical condition. So a lot of medical conditions have uh, specific assessments that might well be more appropriate than some of the general ones that you might utilise. And I've included those references in this uh, screen and in the PowerPoint so that you can look them up yourselves. So if you have a patient with Parkinson's disease, go and look at the literature. There might be something that you think, OK, all right, I need to perhaps use this score or use these scores um, in tandem, united. And that may help uh, some of your patients in your assessment. So this is what you need, as far as I'm concerned, sorry. This is what I feel that um, the assessments should be undertaken by health professionals who are looking at fear of falling with a patient. You need a history of the presenting complaint, and that's the official history, as well as knowing uh, what they are saying to you, what the patient feels that history is. You need a record of any changes in personal ADLs and instrumental ADLs, so using the phone, managing their finances. You need that gait and mobility assessment. You need a cognition screen, fear of falling screen, self-efficacy screen, and an anxiety and a depression screen, so that you can gather that information, do more of an analysis to be able to understand what intervention is required. You need the caregiver's history as well, so they'll be able to tell you what they've noticed, uh, whether there's been an increased reluctance to move, for example, or they're avoiding activity. But you do just need to be aware, as we all know, that uh, the stories are going to be completely different and uh, you just need to judge which bits are actually true. When do you screen? It needs to be accurate, it needs to be consistent, yeah, and then you need to assess that you have done the right thing. And it's important to make the distinction between the fear immediately following a fall and the fear and anxiety that persists past that. My question is, multiple fallers, do we screen them regularly? 
Do we screen them as soon as they come into hospital? So they've had a fall at home. Do we bring them in um, and uh, screen them? Do we wait until they're out in the community? When do the community health professionals do um, a screen? Patients fallen, they go in. Do they do a screen then, an initial screen? Do we start intervention right at that point? Is that going to help? Or do we wait for that two weeks for that fear to probably become embedded? That's my question to the experts. Um, yeah, I think that we need to start some type of intervention as soon as they fall, wherever they fall, so that we can work with them to prevent that fall, um, that fear becoming embedded. So we've looked at the symptoms of fear of falling and the screening tools, including the anxiety and the depression screens. We've uh, had a summary of the information um, that you, I think that you need for the assessment and looking at all of the literature. Uh, and I actually found a brilliant um, uh, lit literature paper today, which actually describes all of that. So I think that that's uh, a fair assumption, a fair assessment to make. When should screening start? And there are studies available for fear of falling with specific medical conditions that we need to be aware of. Thank you. Any questions? I can't ask that, can I? Thank you, Sue. And as we said before, we will send around the presentations afterwards so you can get the links to all those screening tools um, We'll get that around in the next couple of days. Uh, so I'd now like to introduce our next guest speaker, Tony Pedder. Tony is a physiotherapist, graduate um, from Curtin University and has a Masters of Science. Tony has been employed as a senior physiotherapist working in falls prevention in the Department of Rehab and Aged Care at Sir Charles Gardner Hospital for 18 years. His clinical interests predominantly focus on working with the frail and elderly uh, patients within the community and in residential care setting. However, he is engaged in all areas of falls prevention, including inpatients and younger disabled adults at risk of falls. Tony was instrumental in the develop development of the falls specialist role that commenced at Sir Charles Gardner in 2001, which has been subsequently used as a basis for other services across the metro area. He was an inaugural member of the WA Department of Health uh, Falls Executive Advisory Committee in 2005 um, until its um, unfortunate cessation <laughs> last year. He um, has a keen interest in teaching and education and lectures at um, the Curtin School of Physiotherapy, Exercise and Science in Gerontology and he is currently involved in research investigating the use of virtual reality as a teaching modality in, for, for Falls um, in community and inpatient settings. Uh, he's the co-author of a number of papers regarding falls prevention initiatives performed in the ED setting. Tonight, Tony's presentation will provide insight into exercise strategies that assist with the fear of falling. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. I was asked what kind of microphone I wanted, and I said I actually needed a roaming one, and I was asked why, and it says, because the more nervous I am, the more fearful I are, I tend to move everywhere. So if you see me moving over here, it's because I've got this fear. People always ask, they tell me, do you have a fear of presenting? And it's like, um, depends on the circumstance and the context. Tonight, there's a hills here. That's why I'm really nervous, you know? I don't know how many research papers, and he was the first person I used to kind of like cite and quote, you know, 18 years ago when I was starting up in the falls area. Where it was Christy. She's on her way to a PhD. I was like, you got it yet? Sue? She might have it soon, so she's like, you know, she's like, I highly respect her having worked with her, and then with um, Sue. So um, having worked with Sue for a number of years, again, highly respect her. So when I'm actually speaking with other people, get really, really nervous because it's like, I don't want to let the team down because we've got no great experts here. So anyway, we're going to talk about, so I do actually have some strategies that I use to deal with that, and we'll maybe talk about that when we talk about the whole exercise thing. <laughs> right, so we're going to talk about exercise to reduce fear of falling. Now, we know there's lots of factors that contribute to fear of falling, whether they be physical factors, so muscle strength, balance and gait issues, whether they be anxiety issues or whether they be more issues related to contributors for falls. 
um, visual impairment, dizziness, etc. The other thing that I gleaned yesterday from talking to a colleague, well, what about the impact of us as a therapist when we're actually maybe mobilising our patients or intervening in maybe providing exercise or therapy with them? If we're walking with a patient and we always, um, when we're walking with them on the ward, we always say, oh, you're that person's standby assistance. You always need somebody, Mr Smith, to walk down the hallway at the moment. Before you know it, tomorrow they've got to be discharged. What, what effect does that actually create on our patients when they actually go home in terms of potentially mediating fear? Okay. Exercise. Exercise can have a significant impact in terms of reducing the rate of falls. We've got excellent evidence. It's one of the big power interventions that we can do. We know that um, exercise reduces physical risk factors and possibly can also have an impact in terms of decision making and behaviour change. Okay, so we know it works. We know it's good. In terms of translating over to fear of falling, as Keith said, there definitely is evidence there. It's not super strong yet, as it is in the actual just the the rate of falls and the risk of falls, but it's certainly evolving. So what we do know is that if we're going to do exercise to reduce falls, okay, we've got to do a lot of it, and it's got to be sustained. So at least 50 hours of training is what the evidence says. It needs to include a high balance component. Strength is important as well. Walking for high risk fallers, particularly brisk walking, is not advocated. Okay, or we still need to use walking because it's important and it's a functional task, but certainly we shouldn't be encourage our, encouraging our high risk fallers to be going for a brisk walk around the block. Okay, we need to maybe temper the speed and give them some safety guidelines. The type of exercise that has been used and been shown to be effective includes group-based exercise, home-based exercise, and Tai Chi, okay? And really, if we start to think about fear of falling, there's probably not much distinction in terms of the type of exercise that's effective, because it's probably not really the exercise per se, it's probably more how we deliver the intervention that becomes more critical in terms of our education, and the involvement of the client. Okay. Um, other issues in terms of um, frailty, the frailer a person is, we need to maybe start a little bit more gently, be a bit more concerned about their safety. A little asterisk there about targeting both general community and high risk was more about that. We're starting to see some evidence in the community setting about some particular cohorts of patients who we haven't had evidence in the past that falls can be effectively reduced, such as Parkinson's disease and some emerging stuff with cognitive impairment as well. If we want to take a program approach, there's lots of programs that have been shown to be effective in reducing falls. These are all exercise-based programs here. The Otago up on the left-hand corner there, um, Strength and Balance Home-Based Program, most effective in the over 80s. No Falls Program was a, a multi-component program and it was research, but the exercise program was a group program, Strength and Balance, some eye exercises as well, which was quite different to anything else that's been done, and it included a group-based component and then a home program that people would do. The foot and ankle program through Hilton Mensa's group is a more customised specific program effective to reduce falls, but for people with disabling foot pain and foot issues. Okay, so it's quite specific. So for some clients who have got a fear of falling mediated by um, physical deficits and maybe foot pain, that might be a more specific program that we need to implement. The two other programs are actually a little, they differ slightly. The LIFE program is another home-based exercise program. The rationale for it is slightly different in terms of the amount of exercise is not a traditional structured program. It's based on ability and opportunity. It also does talk through the program about the client developing the skills to progress themselves. And with that, improving their self-confidence and their belief in terms of performing activities. It relates it back to many activities of daily living as well because exercises are embedded within that component. The Stepping On program actually isn't just an exercise program. That's a group-based education program um, based over, I think, eight to ten weeks. I can't remember the exact kind of like time span. So within that, there's a lot there about um, knowledge raising, shared experiences about falls, learning about the risk factors for falls, so learning about medication, learning about vision impairment, but also within that program, people get taught a strength and balance program, and that is that is progressed 
over the course of the time and people will then take that homework away and do their exercises at home. So all of these are an excellent starting point for somebody maybe coming in and not, not, not having a lot of experience in working with the false client. This is a great starting point in terms of covering all of the basic kind of like issues we need to address. They all address lower limb extensors. They've all got a range of static and dynamic balance exercises. So they're all great programs in their own sense. So this is a, a, a good starting point for us. So he spoke about exercise to reduce fear of falling. One of the things that does certainly come up is that multi-component programs, so where we include exercise plus some other element, which is generally some kind of cognitive behaviour therapy. Now, I'm no expert in CBT by any stretch of the imagination, but certainly my understanding of it, and when I was doing a bit of research for this, was it was really relating to how do I, as a therapist, maybe deliver the exercise? So what else do I need to be saying to my clients rather than just giving Mrs Smith, you know, your balance exercises to do three days a week, please do them or you'll be in trouble. You know, how else can I better communicate what I want to to my client and actually develop a better relationship? And I think that's probably the key, okay? And the Matter of Balance is a program which comes out of the States. It was based on a University of Boston study um, back in the late 1990s. They then developed that into a lay leader model. So it's a group-based program specifically designed to reduce fear of falling. Similar to the stepping on in that it is basically a program which talks about the knowledge of falls, but also teaches them exercises which are developed over a period of a number of weeks. But there's other things in it which are quite nice, things like assertiveness training. So clients can actually then develop the skills to maybe be a bit more proactive in their health management, maybe speaking to the GP about that medication they've been wanting to talk about for a while. So that's actually quite a nice program. In the States, it's a trainer-based model, so you've got to do a course if you want to become a trainer. It's about $1,500, and then you can deliver that to your group over about eight to ten weeks. Right, so getting on to how exercise can reduce fear of falls. One, we can address specific weaknesses and balance deficits. We can improve ADL performance, and that's through this concept I like to term like task mastery. So actually practising those skills um, that we need to do every day. And the last component is actually improving floor transferability. Many of our clients are fearful of falls because they can't get up. Okay, so they're starting to think, crikey Moses, what happens if I fall? That's often what we hear in our practice in terms of how do we actually get up from the ground? I need to do it because that's the thing which is really holding me back. Unfortunately, we don't have a recipe. I wish there was a recipe. So we're trying to think, okay, how am I going to actually make this message come across a little bit easier for everybody to understand? And it actually was good for me to actually do this, just to reflect in terms of how I do things. So... Fear of falling cycle. We've seen it from Keith and from Sue. There's lots of different versions of this, but I just want to highlight a few things in terms of us starting to establish and develop an exercise program. So in terms of our fearing falling, it's really important that we quantify how bad it is. Is it high or low? Um, is the fear of falling, is it quite task specific? So then as a therapist, can we really address that particular task that is actually the person doesn't want to do? Or is it a more general task? So everything they do, which is probably then becomes even a bit more challenging, they've got this fear and it starts to limit complete participation. And is it consistent with the risk of falls? Have they had a fall and an injury? And how has that injury been managed? How are you managing that injury when the client presents to your GP practice or presents to you in hospital? Okay? So sometimes we don't think about the actual injury in terms of how we have that initial management, but that... What follows the initial management? Often the initial mobilisation, and what's that experience like? So maybe if we manage that situation better, it'll be easier to get therapeutic um, gains later on. Comorbidity is due to immobilisation. I've got a little case study after this which will talk about that very problem. Muscle weakness and weak protective responses. One of the things that happens is, depending on where our client is within this cycle, a client might present with a fall, fear of falling but not actually have the weakness and the balance deficit yet. It's just a fear. But as it progresses, then obviously the weakness and the protective responses can actually develop a lot further. And then it might be that part of our intervention from an exercise perspective is that we need to work harder at improving the physical risks before we start to evolve into actually doing task mastery and training ADLs and other activities that they've actually started to limit. Okay, so you've got to create a stable base 
and then work on actually building their confidence by practicing activities that they, they're maybe not doing. So early mobilisation after a fall. I remember when I used to work on an orthopaedic ward and I can see Heather there, and sometimes on the weekend we go and get the hip fracture patients up, I mean, they'd be screaming and shouting as we would get them up and stuff, and it was just half, you know, harking back on that. And I was thinking, crikey Moses, really, were we doing the best thing with our clients? It's always early mobilisation. You've got to get them up and going, you know, otherwise they're, you know, going to get a clot and going to have deleterious outcomes for these hip fracture patients. So, yes, we know that there's good evidence there, but maybe we need to relook at how we do that. You know, lying flat, straight up over the edge of the bed, likely to maybe have a little bit of postural hypertension. Maybe they've got a bit of vertigo there. Maybe their pain hasn't been managed. No wonder they're fearful of falling by the time they go home, knowing that Tony and Heather have been up to get them out of bed. <laughs> so maybe we need to think about that kind of scenario a little bit more in terms of that initial mobilisation. And that might even follow into a community setting with the GP practice in terms of how we manage maybe that initial soft tissue injury, what advice we give them to allow them to mobilise more quickly in maybe a pain-free kind of like environment a bit earlier on. This case study was a gentleman who we saw um, as part of a, uh, in, in our outpatients. He was 91 year old, very independent. He had a hip fracture um, late last year, or actually a few months ago, or about September 2018. Bad outcome in the fact that he actually ended up with a bad delirium, ended up in delirium unit, and essentially had very little rehabilitation for about three months, at which point he was discharged home with his family, basically wheelchair bound. This chap was driving before, you know, driving down south to his farm. So it was a really poor outcome. We got involved because um, it was part of the discharge. They referred him to us and said, well, you know, is there anything that you guys can do? Um, so when we actually got him, he had all of these complications of a lack of mobilisation. He had a hip, fra um, a hip um, flexion contracture, a knee contracture, significant shortening of the limb. He would pull up on his daughter to stand up rather than push through normal movement pattern. So he was fearful of falling, A, because he, he was very fearful of his leg because his leg was so weak. He had hardly been vertical in three months. So if my physio had on, we had to start thinking about all these different things that we would not traditionally do. We got him onto a tilt table. We would strap him in, get his knee down, try to straighten up his leg. For some of the old physios, he would know about using springs and slings, and we'd hook him up to the roof and trying to get some quads. So we did all these... Uh, different exercises that we would not normally do. So sometimes all I was saying here is that you need to really go back to some basic things sometimes. So there might not be, you know, I can't always tell you exactly what to do, but you've got to be creative and go back to some of the therapies that allow you to, you know, maybe improve quads in a particular range or improve hip extensors in a particular range. So you need to, to be um, creative in a way. Eventually we got him within about um, eight weeks, we got him walking. We got him weight bearing on his leg a bit more effectively, okay? And he got to the point where he still had a couple of falls at home, but he would still be able to get up out of the chair, get out of his bed, walk with his Zimmer frame around the home. Took a while, took a lot of work. Probably would have been better done as an inpatient, but he got moving again. That's my mum, okay? She had a bad fall a couple of years ago at Coles of the Land. <laughs> Going into buy a Christmas present, tripped on something, but she had a bad fall, really nasty fall, ended up in hospital. So she volunteered to actually learn some um, fall prevention exercises, and she's my model here tonight. Okay, so firstly, first consideration, make sure we address physical risk factors. If their quads are weak, we've got to strengthen them. If their glutes are weak, we've got to get into them. If they've got poor static and dynamic balance, we've got to target those issues. So it's really be specific for our clients. So even if you are using like an Otago or a No Falls program, make sure your assessment is detailed enough to possibly have to add other elements too so that you can be quite specific. I think it's always important that our clients understand how balance works. So why are we actually doing the exercise? Why are we strengthening those particular muscles? Why is it important to make sure that we progress the balance and strength exercises? Okay, they need to be well engaged with us if we want them to get good outcomes. Teach them about saving responses. It's okay to take a step or to put your hand on the, on the um, breakfast bench when you lose your balance. That's a good thing, okay? So it's actually then helping them to be aware that if they do that, oh, okay, well, I actually save myself. That's a great thing. I'm actually doing something right here. 
So that can be a positive response in terms of their rehab. Build early towards task mastery. So at the time that you're starting to strengthen, you're starting to train their balance, make sure you start to integrate this to within their functional task that is maybe driving their fear. So if you've got a client who's fearful of walking outside, you need to get back early then with that client in terms of starting to train that activity, okay? How you do that, it might be that the client requires a lot more support then, but you've got to ta start early in terms of building that task mastery through your therapy. Use small incremental achievable goals. So if you've got a client who's having trouble, you know, um, crossing the road, the first bit might be actually walking to the edge of the road, turning left, turning right, actually just looking and remaining confident there. The next bit might be actually negotiating curves up and down. Then it might be walking at an appropriate speed to be able to cross the road. So break the task down into small achievable chunks that the client can actually do and can actually achieve well and start to develop a bit of confidence. Mode.
The fourth recommendation is that occupational therapists should facilitate caregivers, family and friends to adopt the positive approach to risk. So is this just about um, working with our patients to understand that risk is part of their everyday life? Um, and it's about helping patients to achieve a balance between risk and activity. And it's our job as health professionals to work to positive benefit of patients engaging in activity. So obviously maintaining the independence and improved health, for example. So these are some practical strategies that we might use with our patients. Um, I would encourage them to participate in. So obviously we know the importance of exercise and helping them stay active. But also with the exercise, it's um, challenging memory and thinking as well. Um, keeping busy with daily living activities. More and more it's been recognised that actual participating in daily activities is a form of exercise and it's really about allowing them to do as much as they can for themselves. Uh, getting involved in community activities. We all understand the importance of um, keeping patients connected in the community and that socialisation and feeling part of something, especially when they're more and more house down. Learning about your body. So is the pattern of acute injury? Um, what does that pain mean to them? You know, does that mean they have to stop in bed and not move, or can they actually do um, gentle activity and to keep their muscles strong? It's about learning about strategies like energy conservation and pacing, for example. And it's about um, the ongoing reinforcement of general force prevention strategies. So um, have they had their eyes checked in the last 12 months? Do they wear the right footwear, for example? Any interventions that we put in place need to be targeted to the person and based on their individual risk factors. So are they a younger follower? Have they had a history of substance abuse or mental health issues before? Or are they a reoccurring follower? Have they had a lot of fall prevention education before? So it's very different for each patient. We can't underestimate the importance of cognition and behaviour. Um, so it's not only about memory, it's also looking at do they have an awareness of their environment? Can they scan ahead when they're, they're mobilising and identifying new hazards? Do they have protective mobility? So can they adjust and manage as part of the environment? Um, and can they possibly adapt? So can they um, yeah, adapt to new hazards, but can they reason and problem solve as well? Um, group conversations can be useful and we know that there is a strong role in terms of peer to peer um, education. It's uh, encouraging correct techniques. So um, we know that there's a link um, or patients can experience fear of falling in that 6 percent transition. So it's about everyone reinforcing the importance of appropriate um, functional transfer, so not pulling on the train, picking up off a flat surface for example. It's obviously not downplaying um, someone's fear of falling, that's the idea of it and providing education on fear of falling regularly and often, not only to the patient, but to their families. It can be very hard for families to understand what patients are going through when they experience fear of falling. We've talked about um, the role of OT home assessment. I guess it's just very important that we can uh, look at a, a multitude of aspects in the home. And there has been some research, not only on the effectiveness of um, environment and patients um, in certain falls, but there has been um, one study to find on uh, using housing adaptions and measuring uh, fear of falling, and they found that at three months there was a significant difference in terms of fear of falling in patients that had um, housing adaptions completed. And I know there is um, a new COP from the new protocol on the Netherlands is looking at doing some um, collecting all the evidence on environmental um, modifications and how they impact the falls, which is great. So again, that's bringing back the framework, the person environment fit. It's really about understanding the roles that our patients undertake within the home. It's um, having that up to date knowledge system. A lot of new safety products coming out all the time in terms of like supporting the technology. It's not only equipment and rails, it's that environmental redesign as well, making sure patients have Turning spaces they need. Um, and again, it comes to, down to adherence. Um, flight exercise, um, some patients are very attached to their mat. Um, <laughs> so, recently it looked at um, patients' uh, <coughs> of um, 
promoting home recommendations as well. It's about business standards. Right? So a lot of things we recommend patients might not follow through with, but really understanding our patients' priorities about what's important to them, what they're actually going to implement, um, and maybe helping them implement over a, a period of time. So it's about motivation for delivery. It's also about change management with patients to hopefully put these things in place. Again, just getting an early, early identification of intervention is the key. Having those confidence building conversations often and regularly with our patients. Choosing a structured approach. So asking patients to write down their fears um, so they can talk about them when you, when you actually meet with them. As Tony said, it's having very measurable and achievable goals. We don't want to set them up for fail and then set them back further. Um, and Tony highlights the four action plans. They're very important for patients. So it's about that worst case scenario. If, well, if that does happen, how am I going to um, get off the floor? How am I going to get help, for example? And relaxation strategies are appropriate for some patients. So we can't always get rid of the um, the things that form the story, but we can look into control some of the symptoms so they are maybe neutral. And it's other practical things. Are they drinking too much tea and coffee? They can impact on patients' anxiety. Are they sleeping and eating well? Um, and are they drinking alcohol? It might help in the short term, but it's not going to help in the long term and it increases their risk of falling greatly. And just to bring it back to the patient, um, so I had a fall on the front path and then heavily on my knees. I had a lot of confidence after my fall. And although the equipment helps, it does not restore your confidence. The problem with the term risk perception, it, it implies all the risks are the same and they are. And when I was really unwell, I heard a ten calls a day, and this was terrifying. I felt disabled and scared of injury, I had many parts and bruises, and I was embarrassed to be out in public and stuff at home. So it's just really about understanding that every situation is different and our patients are all different. Um, and if we do this, we'll make sure that the interventions we put in place are meaningful. Because we know that if the meaningful activities are uh, associated with um, not injury legally, which is motivation, and they're hopefully sustainable. Thank you, Christy. I'm now going to invite Sue back for her second act. Um, this time she's going to present on the psychological aspects of fear of falling and management strategies. Thank you, Sue. I did forget to say on the last session that I actually have, uh, because I'm quite used to the material in my way, I have actually got a list of the screening assessments for both um, fear of falling and anxiety and depression, when to use them, you put on the clientele and when to use them and the setting to use them. If you want that, it's quite a handy sheet. If you want that, just let Rachel plan uh, on Okay, so um, we've had some really brilliant uh, presentations, I think they're absolutely fantastic, and we've got some uh, great um, practical uh, information about things that we can put in physically. So now I'm just going to turn to the, a little bit to the psychological before finally uh, just trying to sum up a little bit of what we've learned today. Many, many years ago, in another lifetime, I was actually a trained counsellor for sexual trauma. So I would follow patients who had to come to the police station or come to ED, and I would uh, be called out and I would follow them through their journey as far as I possibly could months and years later. It was very, very challenging, and the fear that I saw that was embedded was intense. Fear of falling is similar. I'm not going to say it's any worse or any better because fear is fear. But um, it certainly is the patients and all of the patients that I've seen and that we were seen as health professionals, it's a very intense feeling. So as we know, it, uh, fear of falling is about psychology as well. It's linked to the depression and to the anxiety. Uh, but there are actually, and I was very glad about this, physiological processes. 
So I'm going to look at the brain um, to see uh, what is happening in the brain and how CBT and what we are doing with exercise and home activities and everything else that we've learned about, how that can actually change your, your pathway in your brain. So here, here's part of it, this is number one. So there's multiple receptors and neuropeptides in the brain and these perpetuate here. They remember the incident, they remember the emotion. And then when you come across a relatively similar situation, they bring all of that back up to you and you uh, remember all of that fear and you react all over again. Um, the neuropeptide Y and PY is a very highly conserved neuropeptide and this is one of the key factors in perpetuating this fear and keeping it there. It is involved in a variety of physiological processes and it improves the modulation of the um, emotional and affective dis disorders. So again, very, very key. Now, They talk a lot in the um, literature that I've read about Y1 receptors. So it's this green thing here. And you can see that it's located in multiple areas of your brain. So this is part of the fear pathway. That's my coping for that. So moving on from there, now we know. Um, depression, anxiety and fear, those that have got a high level of depression and anxiety but also syncopies have a very high level of fear so you would, you would understand that if you've got a syncope and you're passing out all the time you'd be absolutely terrified about falling down and where you're passing out and what injuries you would have because you've got no control whatsoever. They found that the sleep quality that you have increased depression and then obviously fear of falling after that. CBT is very, very effective, and we're going to go into that. Uh, but there is a drug called d uh, which used as an adjunct to psychotherapy, has found to be very effective in treating so-called phobias, fear of heights, social phobias, etc. So what is CBT? Actually, what Tony said and what Christy said uh, they pretty much are doing CBT within their work. It's a psychotherapy that aims to assist a person uh, to, it, it teaches them to think in a less negative way. So they recognise a thought that might be negative and they have to turn it around and make it positive. It has uh, effective, it has positive and long-term uh, thinking of the patient and their quality of life. It can be as effective as medication, it's very complex. There's multiple different um, models and treatment programs in CBT, and you do need to be trained to be able to, to deliver it. It is definitely not for everybody. It's a very hard uh, treatment to undergo, and not everybody is able to sustain that. Um, and this, this is an interview with Dr. Steve Perry. He's uh, a UK a professor and he's done a lot of work on CBT and this is how he is explaining fear of falling um, and CBT. Hello and welcome back to another Meet the Experts video. Today we are talking with Dr Steve Parry who is a consultant physician but also a researcher in the university who does research into falls and if you remember back we met um, Dr Perry back in week two. Hi Steve, thank you Morning. for joining us. I want to talk to you today about falls, fear of falling and cognitive behavioural therapy. So let's start off right at the beginning. What is fear of falling? Fear of falling is a term that's used to describe some of the worries and concerns that people have about falls and their consequences. Sometimes that fear is almost to the point of being phobic, so people are, are terribly frightened to even go out of their houses. They become very isolated. 
But even when it's not as extreme as that, fear of falling is an incredibly debilitating condition. It's something that impacts hugely on people's quality of life. Most people who know um, an older person, um, uh, or several older people particularly, will know people who are a little bit anxious about falling, a little bit concerned about falling. And fear of falling is sort of an umbrella term that's used to describe um, all of those psychosocial consequences, if you like, um, of concerns and worries and anxieties about falls. From what you've said there, it sounds like a, a very important and debilitating condition, but how many people are we talking about that it might affect? An astonishing number. And looking at the worldwide literature, some studies have reported as many as 80% of older adults right. having reported fear of falling. From our own experience running a clinic in North Tyneside where everybody had um, a falls efficacy scale, which is one of the uh, measures of fear of falling, uh, a very reliable questionnaire. Uh, on the falls efficacy scale, around 50% of our population, the people coming to the falls service, had fear of falling. And that was a group of older people from the age of 60 and above. So it's not peculiar to the very frail and elderly yeah. at all. Um, this is something that can be a really important factor in people's lives at much younger ages than people would traditionally think of people as having um, worries and concerns about falls. OK, so it's, it's important and it's hugely common. So in that case, it means we probably need to do something about it. Indeed. Um, unfortunately, as with much to do with falls, we're into Cinderella territory here. Um, so this is something that people may acknowledge um, both from uh, the patient's perspective, their carers and families' perspectives, and healthcare professionals' perspectives. But it's something that people feel pretty helpless about, and it's something that, okay, it's, it's another one of those things. There's too many one of those things mm. um, to do with falls and older people, uh, and it's something that really needs uh, some impact in terms of how to address it. Okay, so what is this thing that you've been doing that involves cognitive behavioural therapy, CBT. First off, what is it? What, the CBT? Yeah. So cognitive behavioural therapy is one of the talking treatments. So one of the ways of trying to improve psychological problems through discussion. And cognitive behavioural therapy um, rests on trying to unravel people's um, thought processes that perhaps have become run into a track of circular, unpleasant, ruminating thoughts, things that are not perhaps um, true anymore, if you like. So items of thought and thought processes that drag the person into this spiral of misery and increasing fear and anxiety and cognitive behavioral therapy is a way of trying to unpick some of those abnormal thoughts and correct them so try and show people how best you can improve those thoughts and it's an incredibly useful incredibly effective treatment for all sorts of problems for anxiety depression uh, very very useful indeed so it's a way of trying to help someone change the way they think and behave about something that's right. Uh, and uh, some of the uh, best things about cognitive behavioural therapy is that it's a way of not only helping correct the psychological, but in our particular context here with fear of falling, to try and improve people's thought process in such a way that they feel more confident, appropriately confident rather than inappropriately confident, about improving their physical well-being too. And you did some research into how CBT use, uh, can be used to help people with fear of falling. I believe that's finished now, that study. That's right. Um, are there any preliminary results coming out of that? Yes, yeah, so the study was designed to look at how we could best improve fear of falling in older people through uh, a randomised trial with one arm randomised to cognitive behavioural therapy and the other arm randomised to their normal treatment, so they got everything that they normally would have, uh, as did the uh, patients who underwent cognitive behavioural therapy in addition. 
So the, the, the wrinkle for this study wasn't just that it's the first to look at an individualized cognitive behavioral therapy approach. Uh, the study also is the first to teach cognitive behavioral ter therapy techniques to healthcare assistant grade staff and have them deliver the cognitive behavioral therapy. So the study, um, we recruited 415 people um, who were randomized and then the results um, have been really pretty amazing that in the main outcome measure, which was the falls efficacy scale score, uh, a measure of fear of falling, there were both statistical and clinical improvements in those uh, parameters both at the beginning so that the, the patients had eight weeks of cognitive behavioral therapy an hour at a time then a six month refresher and then we completed the study at a year right the benefits began fairly early on they stayed there through month six and then persisted despite no therapy for six months right the way through to the end of the study so this seems a pretty powerful way of trying to improve people's fear of falling that certainly sounds like impressive results. How did people get on with doing the therapy? The majority of people really enjoyed it, actually. Um, the majority of people had um, very, very positive um, uh, statements around the study and how the cognitive behavioral therapy was delivered. It was an interesting study in other ways in that we uncovered a lot that hasn't been written before in the world literature around fear of falling to do with what underlies the problem. So fear of falling, as I've said, is an umbrella term, but this study's allowed us to unpick an awful lot more of what underlies that around pain, problems with walking, difficulties with strength and balance, as well as psychological constructs like depression, anxiety, and fear, phobic anxiety, that kind of stuff. Okay. Uh, and with the healthcare assistants delivering the um, cognitive behavioral therapy appropriately supervised by clinical psychologists, this gives us a prayer that this could be adopted in the health service. The numbers I gave you before, in terms of how many people suffer from fear of falling, mm -hmm. there's not a chance in the world that qualified psychologists would be available in anything like the number needed to actually deliver this kind of treatment to help the number of people who need it. So the cognitive behavioral therapy delivered by healthcare assistants at least gives us a chance for the healthcare system to be able to afford to do this. Yeah. Now these results really are very much hot off the press. So people can't go and ask their doctor for the therapy immediately. That's but right. fingers crossed that in the future this might be available to more people. Yeah, so they, as you say, this is, this is brand spanking new stuff in the last month or two. We've got the results through. So the results aren't published anywhere yet um, and they need to be submitted to our funding body, the National Institute of Health Research, HTA programme. Um, so uh, very much hot off the presses, but um, I, I would hope that they'll be published in a, in a good peer-reviewed journal so that we can start getting this stuff out into the public domain uh, and try and get more people sorted. Okay. Last question for you. Um, can you give me three of your top tips mm. on how people can prevent falls in their life? Okay. Top tips would be exercise, exercise, exercise. Okay. Uh, and that's, I'm not being at all facetious, from as early as possible in the lifespan, people need to be gearing themselves towards things that keep them mobile and independent, and that as life progresses and our bodies start to fail in subtle ways, to use strength and balance training and strength and balance exercises to keep themselves in that kind of condition. And there's some pretty simple stuff, uh, and I'm sure you'll be able to find readily um, exercises that people will use. Absolutely. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And thanks for joining us. And the fact that you can have a treatment that can actually physically change neural pathways is really quite incredible. 
So we look at um, the parietal lobe. So the parietal lobe, as we know, it's critical for our ability to coordinate behaviour, the rapid behaviour. Um, it uh, also helps uh, with vision, it takes in the, the input from the visual and the auditory and the uh, vestibular. It actually encodes your target. So if you're putting your hand out, it will know what you're putting your hand at and, and help you know where you're putting your hand. So it's, uh, it's, it's quite important to know that, that it's there. It also uh, helps to control your cognitive control networks. So it's very, very key in that area. Then you have, and I hope I say this right, the amygdala. amygdala? Anyway, that's what I'm going to say. Uh, it's located in the temporal lobes, and it is the section of the brain that is responsible for detecting fear and also preparing for emergency events. So it's responsible for the perception of emotions such as anger, fear and sadness, as well as the controlling of aggression. It helps to store memories of events and emotions so that that individual may be able to recognise a similar event in the future. The example that was given is it was a dog bite, then you know, when you get near a dog, you're going to be concerned uh, that you might actually get another bite. It's the same with the risk of falling. So you've already had one fall, you've remembered it, it must be very traumatic, uh, and it's, straight, it's gone straight in there, and as soon as you come across a similar situation or a similar risk, you immediately, um, the amygdala will help that fear to come to the, the very front. They did find that with uh, the uh, Buddhists, um, who do compassion medication, meditation, sorry, uh, it's been shown to actually modulate their amygdala. So what they are doing is just helping to turn their pathways around and it actually changes the shape of the sensitive anatomy. It's quite, quite amazing. So this is very simple as, as uh, I Tony actually said it goes that simple. But CBT is about graded exposure. It's a structured time of around 20 weeks, and they generally, your uh, treatment does not go past that. And the, the counsellor, the psychologist, sorry, works with you uh, to slowly do your follows and talk you through it. Now, like I say, there's many different types. And so this particular one uh, that we're going to look at is uh, a graded exposure, so it will be somebody with them. CBT, you have a situation, you have the thought, that creates your feeling, your feelings then create the behaviour, and the behaviour then creates thoughts, and it's just uh, like a cycle. And I, I challenge you to do that tonight before you go to bed, to uh, actually think of something and see how that creates your feelings and potentially impacts on your behaviour. This is a very, very simplistic uh, example. I thought I would go to the shop, but I fell last time. Now, any psychologist will tell you that the word but is pretty much always um, followed by a negative thought or a negative reaction. Fell last time, and then you might start to feel fear and panic and really um, anxious, really, you know, oh goodness me, perhaps I'm going to fall again if I, if I go. So you decide that the simple way out, which let's face it, it is, um, I'm not going to go to the shop, and then I won't fall, and I'm going to be okay. But then what happens when they need to go to the shop next time? Remember, you've got that uh, fear embedded deep into your brain. It recognises your thought, it recognises your emotion, which is the fear, and you perpetuate that cycle. Whereas with CBT, I'm going to go to the shop with a friend because they'll be beside me and they're going to give me confidence. So you can see immediately it's a much more positive uh, sentence and positive thought. Because of that, you think, okay, I'm, I'm going to feel much safer. I'm probably going to be a lot less anxious. Uh, I'm going to have somebody with me. I'm going to have some fun. We're going to have a cup of tea. It's going to be great. You go to the shops. 
and you realise that next time you're going to have a lot more confidence and you may even go by yourself or you might choose your friend again. But you now have conquered uh, that um, negative thought and turned it into a positive. Now I can tell you that now that that will take a long time to do. It's not a quick fix. It's going to take a long time. You have to think of every thought and you have to catch it and what, work out whether it's negative or positive and then change your thinking. This is one of the websites for CBT. Uh, it's very, very good. It has courses for people who suffer from various medical um, mental health conditions. It also uh, chronic pain. I was talking to Maddie, I think it was earlier. And uh, there is actually now um, a CBT therapy for people with chronic pain, which is shown to be very, very effective. Uh, it's also got courses for clinicians. So this is uh, just a little bit of a roundup of some of the um, some of the events that, that <coughs> is around in our district. Where is it? Uh, so we've got uh, the review that Tony uh, provided with us earlier um, by Wheels Health, and it shows a significant retention of benefits uh, of fear of falling at 12 months and beyond. This is uh, Dr. Perry, who we've just seen. Uh, it was in the NHS. It was a delivery of a program by healthcare assistants. They were uh, trained in the intervention, which was CBTI, and was slightly modified, and they were trained in that by psychologists and supervised by psychologists. Um, and this was given to the control group and the, obviously the intervention group. And they found that in the intervention group there was a significant reduction in the test, and the next thing they had so was people anxiety and depression score. But the problem was that they didn't find that it was there was no evidence that it was cost effective. And certainly in the NHS, for those of you who know, cost is a massive, massive uh, issue um, as it is becoming here. Then you've got, uh, this very long title, the association between generalised anxiety disorder, subthreshold anxiety symptoms and fear of falling among our older adults. If it's not, let me read it up. But anyway, um, small study, 25 older adults, and they've utilised uh, these various different scores, uh, so the anxiety disorder interview schedule, uh, the uh, geriatric anxiety inventory, etc., etc. Uh, but they found that fear of falling was significantly correlated with um, the gap, so the generalised anxiety disorder, and that treatment of the fear of falling actually um, actually improved the gap in the anxiety uh, symptoms. Uh, so the, their recommendation was that clinicians should screen for organic anxiety symptoms. The effect of a multi-component cognition behavioural group intervention. Uh, again, this uh, was uh, one sleep free intervention for eight weeks. The results showed that at two, eight, and 14 months, there was a significant difference in the intervention group in fear of falling. So it was consistently maintained past the intervention. And the recommendations uh, were to reach the prior population. We have another one here, which is around community older people systematic review. It turned out that 19 papers were included in that review and it showed that in trials within all the multifactorial factorial programs um, it actually showed uh, good effectiveness at reducing the fear of falling. And here the only two recommendations that I think that came out of there that are worth noting is that the first must be utilised and that force related self-efficacy must be measured. Uh, another one was exposure-based CBT. So exposure-based is where you take people out and do that um, particular action. So if it's walking to the mailbox, you know, a lot of walking to the mailbox, then uh, it is you need to go with that person. So similar to what um, Tony was saying, very effective in reducing fear of falling. Some further interventions. Uh, there's yoga. Yoga is up and running along with Pilates. There's quite a few um, studies. Not all of them are good, uh, but it, it, this one particularly showed that um, yoga had reduced depression and fear of falling. But the authors actually felt that it was more due to the breathing. So we all know of a, of a 
pregnant, but you have to be breathing is very specific. And uh, so they, they believe that teaching this really did help to calm them and to help their fear of going. Talking it through, similar to what Kristen has said, simple education, those group sessions, talking to their peers, so much better to talk to somebody of your own age. Confidence building conversations and family and friends are very important. So the patient might not be able to talk to the family and tell them how they're feeling. And that's where health professionals really come in. You need to bring that family together, explain about fear of falling and what they can do to help their loved one. Some pharmacological interventions. So the neurotransmitter systems include serotonin, dopamine, noradrenaline, histamine, as well as some others which I can't pronounce. And they are, we have all heard of these, and we all know that there is a lot of medication around. So dopamine, we know we've got that that treats Parkinson's. Serotonin, we know that is what treats um, depression. So you might have fear of falling, but not depression, but there are studies to show that uh, giving a, a serotonin uptake will help to reduce that fear of falling. So it's another intervention that we can use. Um, hip protectors, this still makes me laugh. So hip protectors improve self-efficacy. They did this study with patients in a residential <coughs> care, and they asked them what their fear of falling was, um, and it was high. And then they gave them all hip protectors and it reduced. So, so having hip protectors actually increased their confidence and reduced their fear of falling. Vision review and assessment, as we've seen, the parietal lobe, uh, looking after part of that input from vision, uh, visual um, what's the word? input. Uh, we need to know what's happening with, with vision anyway so that we can work on that. What else can we do? So, uh, for the second, strong partnerships with the consumer and with the carers, uh, reporting and documentation. So it's no good doing, for example, these things and interventions in hospital if they don't know the health professionals outside in the community know what's happened. So we need to be very, very careful that we document and communicate very, very well. We need to assess the depression and anxiety and make sure that those referrals go through to psychologists and mental health specialists. So a bit of a summary, the physiology of the high fear and how it is stored and transmitted. So it definitely is up there, um, but we can change that high fear with the care that we deliver. CBT, very, very effective. Uh, I found that there are, and we can ask Chris later, but I found that there are gaps in meditation and breathing exercise. Reading this yoga, the yoga um, articles and papers, I just thought, oh, well, yeah, I'm reading about the monks um, and how they've changed uh, the amygdala uh, through their meditation. Is there anything out there uh, for ordinary people to do? So there are gaps in hospital assessment. I really could define very, very much that actually the hybrid hospital uh, assessment and interventions in fear of falling. There are gaps in formal communication and in terminology. It's not very clear as far as I could see. A guideline for best, best practice, something that really helps us to know what to do and when to do it. At the moment, it's very much piecemeal. And it's very much dependent on the ERR judgment, but it's only what we know. If we don't know, how can we make an informed judgment? There are kind of consequences, obviously, for public expenditure uh, because of the health utilisation will increase. So, um, thanks, Keith. I think the next two slides are yours. So, preliminary results suggest that interventions that incorporate physical and psychological components are more likely to be effective in managing the fear of falling. There is a range of additional uh, physical and psychological measures uh, that are essential for comprehensive assessment as well as treatment. Early identification of those interventions is more likely to improve outcomes. Food 
three or four new member introduced. As a team, using all of our skills and services available, armed with the evidence and great communication, we really can make a difference. We work very hard to be a partnership with the consumer and the family, and with clear calling, we really need to ensure that that happens. So we're now going to invite all our speakers back up onto the stage to uh, have a panel discussion, um, which Sue has kindly offered to facilitate. I think she thinks that if she's facilitating it, she won't have to answer any questions. <laughs> um, so um, Chloe's going to be roaming around with a spare microphone, so if you can pop your hand up um, if you have a question, and um, we will ask the, the panel to discuss. So we know that um, obviously that's an integral part of reducing falls, but what I find with a lot of patients is they don't like having their balance challenged. That getting into that zone of um, being uncomfortable with the balance, we know that's where we're going to make the most gains, but they just want to stay safe. So what are some practical tips for getting them uncomfortable, uh, comfortable with being uncomfortable? <laughs> <laughs> In your vast experience. Vast experience. Well, you've got to always have success, that's for sure. Um, certainly, I do tend to adopt a strategy of starting really quite easy. Um, and it is just to try to build their confidence and make them want to participate. Um, do a lot of work in terms of, if we're giving clients like a home program and maybe distributing them to that centre. Make them feel that initially, because there's often errors in how they're doing it, make them feel that we've reinforced a lot early, make them feel that we're checking their technique and things. Um, maybe involving them as a group, maybe incorporating another activity which involves them taking their hands off, so maybe the burden with the Thai shields and modified Thai shields that don't use their arms. Um, explaining about kind of like how balance responses and graph responses and that they can take their hands off. It's a very quick reaction, it happens almost automatically when they lose if they like to respond. Um, they're probably not the common people. Using family to assist or to supervise or make sure that they understand the importance of getting hands on. But it can be like really difficult. If people really lack a lot of confidence, it's taken a long journey to actually get to that point. Well, you might never get there for some clients, and that's just something that we need to attend. Um, supervising all the emergencies, so like, um, Think of the outdoor activities. Is using a therapy system is a great deal to actually facilitate that activity, practice lots of skills during that time, um, and then hopefully try to take off slowly. And knowing that you're contactable and you're available to actually assist you. I think you've answered it to uh, a pretty comprehensively. There's only a couple of little bits that I might add. One is around. <clears throat> with, with any exercise, you can grade it uh, with small changes to position, um, whether you're introducing to a task or not, uh, upper body movement as well. So, so you, but working on where they're at and just gradually increasing, so you may have to start. So the environment, boxing a person in, uh, giving them a sense of security, it, it's a bit of a fine line between making it dependent on that. But uh, I kind of think it's just perhaps even a few bit of fingertip support that means you're not really challenging balance, but you're getting them into the habit of doing exercise and then can gradually withdraw it. But in home exercise, I usually get a wall behind, a bench or a chair on each side, and it's, it's there so that you've got that confidence that you can do it, and they, they will gradually push that. The one other thing I want to mention is Tai Chi, and um, it has come up in a number of the presentations, which was great to see. It is such a gentle form of exercise. People don't even feel that they're exercising often, but it is one of the best things for, for false prevention from an exercise point of view, but also from the um, body awareness, the relaxation, all those other things as well. So I think it's a great approach. The other thing is maybe like, um, yeah, 
accumulated for the third. Um, this is some kind of dilute analysis I have to do with actually realize that task. And actually, just giving this case relevant is that using this case, I have to get the study to the enriching activity, which I want to have the end of the process and get something else to happen. So, maybe changing the way that it's constructed or making it related to another activity and then say, it's very similar to that, that activity or one that I have, I've actually wanted you to do. You actually do that really well. So, Thank you very much. Does that that help us? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Any other questions? Don't always necessarily look at both things. So some were actually looking at the rate of falls and also a measure of fear of falling. Others were maybe just looking at the rate of falls, and others were maybe just looking at the fear of falling. I can't recall exactly the top of my head whether there was the social, whether there was a study that produced the fear of falling and falls. There was Lindy Clemson study on the life program. She used a measure of balanced confidence, I think. So in her study, there was a reduction in falls and I think an improvement in balanced confidence for that study. I'm not sure about checking on. The matter of balance one, um, which was by Histra in 1999, I think for there, that was more, I think, about the fear of falling being improved in self-confidence. But again, I don't know about the actual rate of falls, whether they just follow up. Probably the only thing I'll add is that um, fear of falling, um, it, it has to be in the context of the person's ability. And so uh, if, if you're looking at group data, that might not tell you. Um, but what the ideal is to get the best level of confidence with the best level of balance function. Uh, and that's not easy to measure in these sort of group studies. And for some people getting their fear down too much Work on the balance or getting sufficient improvement in balance, we actually increase the risk of falling. So it's it's very complex, and I think um, that that question hasn't really been well addressed in the research. I would think that you probably be wanting some kind of study which tracks individuals rather than group, because there's no point reducing fear of falling at the group measure, but actually the people who are reducing fear of falling are maybe not the ones who actually fall over that assessment period. So probably that maybe you think that kind of like. Thank you very much. That's all right. Any other questions? No, I just, I do actually have a couple. Sorry. Meditation. Are there any studies around meditation and breathing exercises that, that can help as part of the intervention? No, I don't know. I'm not saying that I don't exist, but I don't know. Keith? No, I don't think in a lot of these areas, there's things we think might help. And uh, in that case, it's good to bring some clients with good patients. Uh, there's no doubt that the anxiety side of things is a relatively relevant component of what we're talking about. And any way we can address that. What should we do straight away to help minimise um, persistent 
Three or four then. Yeah, three or four. And then steal it from the people in the hospital, or yes. one that they've already got and then they have to fall off. Well, let's say that they've come in with no fear of falling, and they think they've had a fall. And of course, you get fearful after the fall. But is there something that we can put into place right at that point during their hospital stay that will reduce the risk of a persistent fear of falling? Um, so actually, wondering whether our health system is actually set up to be able to do that effectively. You know, we've got a system where people are in, being assessed, taken boards, lots of the rehab bits. So there's rapid, you know, rapid movement through the hospital system, which means that they don't have exposure to regular staff, staff rush, got to get them up quick, got to get them moving. So I wonder whether maybe the system or the there's some system limitations there, along with probably the cultural and staff and all of that as well. And I think that would be like a nice and easy system would allow us to maybe have a bit more time with some of our patients and things to actually help to alleviate the things that develop from maybe an inability to intervene like we would like. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. That's probably that initial education. That's the best thing you could do with a patient to actually raise the awareness that there is such a thing as fear of falling and that patients, you know, that can lead on to, you know, that, um, yeah, it's an injury, yeah, and yeah. 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 it's understanding that the acute injury and the pain and, you know, how yeah. um, they can rise through that and how we can help them. Cool. Is there anybody else here who you've got a question? Yeah. Um, oh, we've had a loud voice. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. apart from CBT, so I assume most people who are on training, is there any other evidence or any other type of thing, motivation, injury, or anything else that people are asking to do? I tend to like, so I'm not, I'm not trained in CBT at all. I suppose the things like motivational interview, interviewing techniques, are probably helping you to get from that point where maybe people are saying things in a negative way to a possibly positive way. So you're finding out what drives them, what's their goals, what are their, what are their fears, you know, what are their actions that is generated by having this fear. So your assessment techniques that you're using having the ability to develop a form and all that kind of stuff. I mean, not really mentioning CBT, but I think just from reading it and from my limited knowledge, it, it all seems to be relatively similar, but obviously a skilled practitioner is going to be much better at being able to tease things out. I mean, the way I see it in my unskilled kind of way is I like to get to know my patient before I do any kind of like test, you know, fairs or whatever. I want to get to know my patient really, really well. I want to understand through a subjective history before I actually do any objective scoring, what are some of the things that they're not doing? What are some of the things which, you know, um, from a physical and social participation, you know, they're, they're no longer able to do, they've restricted their activities and stuff. To me, that's really important because that often gives me, straight away, I know that they're not walking outside or they're not going down to the gym anymore. So you've already got these activities and tasks which you need, you, you need to actually work towards. So I think it's getting to know that person, developing rapport, then being confident in, in you as a therapist or as a practitioner of whatever sort, and then being able to develop some goals and work towards it and stuff. So, I mean, Lindy Clemson's work with the life and stepping on, it's not so much, you know, I don't think specifically, definitely within life, it's not so much about CBT, but it's about involving and engaging the client, letting them know what they're able to do now, what are the opportunities for exercise and building self-efficacy during small incremental goals. So, I mean, I don't know whether that sits in the whole CBT and psychological kind of like area, because I'm not skilled in the area, but I, I think, think that's very similar. Yeah, yeah I think it's the kind of like rapport with the therapist that becomes pretty important. Motivation interviewing and your skill as a practitioner, I think, would be absolutely essential.
graduated exposure at risk is again something. What can the person do? It's the same with funds, prescription. What can they do? How can I make that a little bit more difficult? Those are things, the decisions that, that we're making all the time in our therapy. And that is part of the kind of behavioural therapy. It's not the total package, but they're parts that we can do. But it's not You will know as, a, as an OT that you can deliver a particular intervention one way, which is probably not the preferred way, but you can also deliver it the way that you think is gold standard. So the closer we get to that gold standard in terms of patient education and knowledge, I think is probably, you know, you're hopefully going to get a better outcome than doing it maybe the bad way. Thank you. Question back here. Sorry, I just want to ask a question. Sorry. The question is for you, Sue, and probably for the rest of the panel as well. Um, in your first presentation, you mentioned about cultural consideration, and you touched on quite a few times about meditation and yoga. Of course, keep in mind, not every culture and embrace, openly embrace meditation and yoga. And especially when you're working with seniors, most of them are set, and, you know, they have set values and beliefs already. It's hard for them to you know, convince them to change or try to adopt new way of you know, breathing exercise of yoga. So do you have any other strategies or recommendations that's alternative to meditation and yoga? I would be talking to the family and to also doing a bit of a read-up on the different cultures because there's so many different cultures and different ways and different traditions. And certainly, yoga and breathing and medication is definitely not for every culture. So I would be asking people of that, I say culture, I keep saying culture, but I would be asking people of that culture, whether it was a family or others, asking what uh, they would recommend or what happened, you know, that they felt would be uh, appropriate, culturally appropriate. Because there are going to be, um, I don't know really, I mean, in, in your culture, is there something that would be, uh, would you take the place of yoga or uh, breathing? You could help me out. <laughs> well, coming from Berber, there would be a multitude of religions as well. So yes. Religion as well, though, can be very, um, very fulfilling, can't it, in, in some cultures, and that often may be what, all that they need. You know, there are, uh, for example, um, Catholics who go and uh, do confession, um, but that's a method of talking things through, and there'll be other cultures that perhaps that have not something similar, but they're able to act with religion um, and help. To talk, basically, and talk in the family. I think just trying to to, um, to get to know the patient or the client really well, and then from there you will learn a bit about them. And I think as a practitioner, that's all that we can do when we're it's because there's so many different cultures in the world, we can't know about all of them, but we learn every day from being exposed to different people. And that's where then that helps us maybe the next opportunity that we when we encounter that maybe that's the same culture, maybe we've learned from the patient before. Because our patients are actually the best teachers for us. And we could do some reading up on it as well. <laughs> Thank you very, very much for the question. Appreciate that. Anybody else? Oh, yeah. hello. Yeah. Hope it's the last question. I was just wondering if you, you talked about involving family and carers and I wonder if you have any strategies that you found successful that help a family engage with the person who has the fear of falling. An example would be say a 90 year old man living on his own in the community has had a number of falls, knee replacements and things like that and um, physio, community physio 
generally you know, only been able to come once a week. Uh, when the physio is sick and comes once a fortnight, needs some exercises, and the elderly man says, well, they're for the calf, they've got nothing to do with my knee, and they're not going to help me stop falling. And therefore, the family member is left with trying to explain it and also trying to engage that person. So I'm just trying to think, are there any other strategies? Um, yes, you can have, put things on the calendar, tick when you've done the exercises. I'm trying to think of anything else that might persuade a, a 90-year-old father um, <laughs> in the UK to actually be motivated <laughs> and adhere to this. Because I'm going there in five weeks' time, and I just want to know how to do this. I think um, family are often the, the last people to be listened to, um, uh, but engaging the family and carers uh, and it's probably a little different in your situation if we're thinking more generally um, in the assessment in the discussion around uh, what and why we're doing things can often help say can reinforce a lot uh, in between when you're so far away that again is, is another challenge so you need other strategies but um, Families can be wonderful facilitators and they can be fantastic barriers as well. So again, it's not a, uh, a, a firm ruling on, on that. But. Certainly, for instance, if I deliver a program, I might have I might customise how I'm delivering it. So for some situations, I might actually use a photo rather than kind of like a stick image. Other clients like a lot of description. Other clients, I might just have a photo of them standing on their toes, no words at all, and then the number of times and stuff. So I will try to vary it based on the client, but I don't think there's a necessarily a right or wrong way. I suppose it's probably trial and error and understanding. A particular gentleman concerned in terms of what's actually. Yeah, sorry. It's a, it's a difficult one. Yeah. yeah. That's what's interesting here because ultimately, if he is going to, it doesn't matter what picture you're going to use, if, he, if there's not something in the agenda here that he is motivated for or by, he's not going to use it. It's back to the so it gets back to that initial kind of like assessment, description and discussion with him of what does he want to achieve, what does he want to do. <laughs> yeah, and why does he want to go? So if he doesn't want to go, is it actually justifiable? And at some point in time, is it actually the prerogative that they have to say, hey, but I don't want to go. And Okay, I'm, I need to wrap things up now. I'm very sorry. If you've got any more questions, please just email Stay On Your Feet um, because they will pass the questions on to us and we will happily answer it. Now, I just need to hand over to Rachel just to finish off. Um, so, thank you very much. Um, so, the question is, what Registrations are open for the conference.
abstracts in September and we are looking forward to having a wide variety of abstracts from community settings through to hospital and residential care. Um, whether you've been doing a, a small on the ground little pilot project, we want to know. Um, it's all about sharing information um, and um, yeah, so please put in an abstract for the conference. Um, also, uh, Injury Matters has our Check Your Medicines Forum, which is uh, going to be on next Wednesday night um, with guest speaker Andrew Stafford, who um, is talking about medication and de-prescription um, in older adults around sleeping tablets. So um, that is free and is being run um, in partnership with the Pharmaceutical Society and will be held in Subiaco. So if you're interested in going, please let us know and we can pop you down for that. Um, just finally, um, on your uh, seat, you will have noticed there is an evaluation form. If you wouldn't mind taking a couple of minutes just to fill that in, um, you can either leave it on your seat or pop it on the table out the front. And um, we use that information to inform you know, how the event was and what we can do better in the future and what topics you might like to see us um, run events on in the future. Um, and I think that is all. So um, the presentation, um, we have been recording the webinar and uh, the presentations um, will be circulated around after the event. Um, we'll also send you um, a certificate that you have attended it if you use that for CPD points. So thank you very much and thank you again for the presentation.